Okay, good afternoon. I'm Bruce Choi from the Global Risk Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, Building Climate Resilience in Canada's Pension Funds. Now, although this event is virtual and many of you are joining from Canada and beyond, across Canada and beyond, I'd like to acknowledge the GRI's headquarters in Toronto, which is situated on the traditional territory of many nations and is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Through this land acknowledgement, we want to bring context to the history of our country and the importance of working towards reconciliation in all ways we can. Before we begin today's session, I would like to review a few housekeeping details. So please note your microphones have been muted to avoid background noise. We've allocated ample time for questions, which we'll take through the chat function on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Please put questions forward to all panelists and we'll address as many as we can. And finally, your feedback is valuable to us. After you leave today, a short survey will promptly appear and we will appreciate your consideration for future programming. Now, let me introduce you to today's moderator, Alexandra Fisher, Manager in Sustainable Finance here at GRI. Alexandra is an ESG specialist with over a decade of experience across institutional investors, government, and the energy sector. She specializes in translating ESG data into actionable insights and ESG risk management. Prior to joining us here at GRI, she had roles with the government of Alberta's Ministry of Energy and with AIMCO. Alexandra, over to you. Thanks, Bruce. So Canada's pension funds have a long history of financial strength. They've continually adapted to new risks and emerged from the financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic relatively unscathed. This resilience has allowed Canadian workers to trust in the security of their retirement income. But climate change has introduced a range of new risks for financial in institutions and investors, particularly pensions dedicated to achieving long-term risk-adjusted returns. Climate risks have far-reaching financial impacts in breadth and magnitude. And unlike most other financial risks, climate risks are not cyclical and instead keep increasing. These risks will continue to manifest as the global economy transitions to a low carbon model that is potentially disruptive and the physical impacts of climate change will worsen and accelerate. In order to build climate resilience, many of Canada's largest pension funds have committed to net zero emissions by 2050. Yet many Canadians continue to be increasingly concerned about how these risks are managed. The report building climate resilience in Canada sorry, in Canada's pension funds was released in July and explains the challenges that researchers, regulators, and everyday Canadians face in determining the climate risks associated with their retirement savings and provides guidance to help stakeholders understand the current state of these risks. It also provides practical guidance and recommendations on how pension funds can strengthen their climate resilience. The presentation from the Sustainable Prosperity Institute will discuss how pension funds can build climate resilience and credibility with their beneficiaries through their climate commitments, implementation strategies, and transparent disclosures. These actions are particularly important given Canada's dynamic involving sustainable finance landscape. First off, I would like to introduce our speakers for today's session. Catherine Monaghan, is a senior fellow at the Smart Prosperity Institute. Catherine has over 15 years experience working in climate change policy development and analysis with experience working across public and private sectors. Her expertise spans regulatory analysis, market-based approaches, energy policy, and the nature climate nexus. Anik Islam is a research associate at Smart Prosperity Institute and works on sustainable finance, green industrial strategy, and the green fiscal policy development. I'll now pass it over to Catherine and Anique for their presentation on building climate resilience in Canada's pension funds. Uh, thank you, thank you for that introduction. And uh, before we start off, we'd like to thank the GRI for funding this work. In particular, we'd like to thank Sally Shen, Bruce Choi, 
Yubobu and Alison Slater for providing helpful feedback earlier on the report. We'd also like to thank our viewers, uh, Barb Zwan from University Pension Plan, Kaylin Welch from the Institute for Sustainable Finance, and Derek Hermanitz and Mike Chan from Environment and Climate Change Canada for also providing early feedback on our report. And from SPI, I would like to thank Derek Eaton, Mike Wilson, Trudy Zendel, uh, Carrie Ann Blank, Alice Irene Whitaker, Mac Radburn, uh, Kiana Klassen, and Fran Francisco Chavez for all their help and support for pushing this report through. So before we start off, I'd, uh, we'd like to split the presentation in two. Uh, so I'll take you through the first couple of slides where we'll uh, build on the context setting for our analysis, and Catherine will uh, do the rest of it where she will uh, take from uh, take over for the rest of the analysis on how to build a climate resilience in Canada's pension plan. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as we know, Canadians are di directly connected to the drivers and solutions for climate change, not only as consumers and voters, but as savers and investors uh, and pension holders. We know that the retirement savings of Canadians will be affected by climate change. But at the same time, th these huge pool of retirement savings can be used to mitigate and adapt to the uh, risks related to climate change and also uh, provide worthwhile investment opportunities in uh, Canada's transition to net zero emissions economy. However, many Canadians are unaware how their pension plans are managing these climate related risks. Um, beneficiaries, researchers and other stakeholders may find it very difficult to keep track of uh, their commitments and progress on climate related risks and opportunities. Uh, given the uh, opaque nature of disclosures and lack of mandatory disclosure requirements on these uh, promises. So, with the largest Canadian pensions managing at least 2 trillion in assets as per last year's estimates, the, uh, the Canadian pension funds, or as the Economist magazine terms them as the maple revolutionaries, need to invest wisely to protect against climate related risks and seize these investment opportunities. So, with that in mind, uh, our research tries to answer the question, how can Canadian pension funds strengthen climate resilience? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, as uh, long-term global investors, Canadian pension funds are significantly exposed to climate risks, uh, which affects their main ability to uh, meet their beneficiary obligations. Now, these obligations range from having absolute returns to uh, maintaining a fully funded status, uh, and these differs across the plans. Uh, climate risks can be divided into three types. So we first off, we have the physical risks, the risks associated with extreme temperature and weather related events, which ultimately affect financial returns. So these uh, physical risks might affect investments directly through suppose uh, damage to assets or indirectly through uh, disruptions in labor or supply chain. Uh, we also, uh, uh, the pension funds also face uh, transition risks, which are risks associated with the shift towards a low carbon economy, and which may transmit through technological um, policy and economics, so changes in consumption and production patterns. These pose market and investment risks and ultimately affects uh, the pensions returns. The third one is liability risks or lists associated with legal processes to align accountability for climate change. A good example of this risk would be the uh, case against the Retail Employee Superannuation Trust or REST in Australia. Uh, in that context, one of the trustees of REST uh, filed a case against them uh, for not disclosing climate related risks and opportunities. And so, while that case was settled out of court, it did uh, enhance uh, net zero accountability in Australia. And while Canada has not faced such uh, litigation uh, processes um, till now, this is something to be wary about in the future. Um, climate change related risks are difficult to assess, mainly because of three reasons. First, uh, because of the uncertainty in drivers and outcomes. So it is very um, difficult to say ex ante how these climate related risks will play out in the future. Second, historical trends might not be a good 
uh, indicator of future outcomes, as is the case with most financial investments and decision making. Third, physical and transition risks play out in a myriad of ways, and so it may be difficult to gauge uh, climate risks from there. For example, a faster transition might uh, reduce physical risks, but at the same time, it uh, increases transition risks. So it is difficult to say how it will play out in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So to better understand climate related risk, Canadian pension funds need to do the following. One, they need to work on advanced climate risk modeling and scenario analysis. And two, uh, they need accurate information from their portfolio companies and assets. For physical risk assessment, this includes things like localized flood mapping or heat wave damage assessments, which can help gauge risk profile uh, for their physical assets. Uh, Canadian pension funds are big investors in uh, real assets, such as infrastructure, natural resources, and real estate. And so it is important for them to engage in uh, climate risk modeling and scenario analysis to gauge these risks and uh, account for their returns. For transition risks, this includes macroeconomic scenario analysis uh, for low carbon transition. Uh, this includes modeling through DSGE or IAM type models. And which have been recently conducted by the Bank of Canada and OSFI. These type of analysis can provide uh, like a springboard for their own analysis, for the pension fund's own analysis on transition risks. At the same time, they need accurate information from their portfolio companies so that they can make informed decisions. Uh, but as we know, uh, these uh, accurate information is hard to come by because this information uh, is not available, it is difficult to obtain, or it is incomplete, inconsistent, and incomparable. A good case would be the full scope of GHG emissions, especially scope 3 emissions, which are down the value chains. On top of that, it is difficult because climate-related disclosures are not yet mandatory in Canada, and we can come back to this on how like governments and other stakeholders can play a part. So next slide, please. So while we have talked about opportunity, uh, sorry, sorry, risks, we would like to focus on climate related opportunities. Um, the net zero transition requires massive investments, hundreds of trillions of dollars. For example, according to the International Energy Agency, clean energy investment requirements would be around four to five US uh, trillion dollars per year by 2030. And so the report points to around uh, current investments being around 1.2 trillion. So there's a huge gap there. At the same time, Canada's uh, federal budget 2022 estimates that Canada's net zero transition would require somewhere around 125 to 140 billion dollars per year. And so the gap there was estimated to be around 115 billion Canadian dollars per year. So with these uh, invest, uh, like investment, huge massive investment requirements um, as patient allocators of long term capital, can, Canadian pension funds can positively contribute to the low carbon transition through investments in green and transition assets. Um, these uh, investments in transition assets are uh, expected to provide significant returns over the long term. Um, but here we'd like to clarify that, uh, and as we have mentioned in the report, that Canadian uh, pension plans are uh, global investors and most of their investments are outside Canada. And so it is up to the Canadian pension funds and other stakeholders to find ways to channel some of that money to meet uh, Canada's net zero transition investment requirements uh, by making uh, investment opportunities here attractive and bankable for the funds. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we have talked about investment uh, risks and opportunities in terms of climate, related, uh, climate change, We'd like to point out what Canadian pension funds are doing. So, in order to build climate resilience, eight of the largest Canadian pension funds, which includes the recent uh, university pension plan, have committed to net zero by 2050 or sooner. And they also have plans to bolster investments in climate solutions. Um, these net zero commitments vary across the funds. And this uh, variation is reflective of their differences in mandates, portfolio and investment strategies, and information availability on their end. So, um, 
uh, uh, broadly in our report, what we did was analyze these uh, net zero plans and commitments across four dimensions. Uh, first off, we have the boundaries for the targets, which includes target coverage, scope of emissions covered. And so the good news is uh, the Canadian pension plans are trying to include all scope of emissions uh, for their net zero commitments. The second dimension is the time frame, so short versus long term investments. So some of the pension plans have included interim targets as part of their plans and while others are working towards that. And so it is important because uh, these interim targets provide guardrails against emissions management uh, and uh, emissions reduction in the long run. The th third dimension is mitigation strategies, and these range from divestment to active engagement. So some uh, Canadian pension plans have active divestment targets where they uh, want to reduce uh, investments in high carbon or fossil fuel related assets. But most Canadian pension funds have active engagement where they want to work together with high carbon companies to reduce their emissions and uh, contribute to real uh, emissions reductions in the real economy. And the fourth dimension is climate solutions where um, the pension plans have targets for investing in green and transition assets. So uh, with this in mind, I would like to pass over to my Catherine uh, call colleague Catherine uh, to continue with the rest of the presentation where she will talk about how uh, uh, Canadian pension funds can build climate resilience. Over to you, Catherine. Okay, thanks so much, Nick. Yeah, next slide. Um, so, hello everyone and uh, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, so, while well, Nick has already taken you through some of the background on climate risks and the current status of action, I'm going to talk about our recommendations for how pension plan sponsors or administrators um, can build climate resilience going forward. So I'll cover four areas uh, that are important in this respect and that noting that they're all uh, interconnected. So they are net zero commitments, net zero implementation, net zero credibility, and then net zero disclosure. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's starting with the net zero commitments. Uh, so, as Nick mentioned, several of Canada's top pension funds have already taken on uh, net zero emission commitments and others are in the process of doing so. So, this really aligns to the inevitable policy response and the shifting landscape of relative prices, technology and consumer behavior as climate change accelerates. So as pension funds sort of represent these investors with this longer term horizon uh, and responsible stewards uh, for retirement savings, we're hoping to see the coverage of these net zero uh, targets uh, expand across the sector. So targets can be set for mid-century or sooner. Uh, for example, we've seen a 2040 climate neutral commitment in July from the University Pension Fund. Uh, but we also need to see shorter term or interim targets. Uh, so to make current stakeholders more accountable rather than sort of punting the responsibility down the line and in order to ensure steady progress along a realistic pathway to net zero. Uh, pension funds also need to reassess the starting point for their commitment. Uh, so this means improving their GHG emissions uh, measurements and other metrics that are important to their target across their portfolio. So measuring zero is pretty easy, uh, but the trajectory is not. So we'll talk more about this measurement uh, challenge in the next slides. And finally, uh, pension funds can set additional targets for climate sol solutions or physical risks, noting that these um, uh, are separate from the net zero uh, targets. Next slide, please. Okay, so with pension funds committing to new climate uh, ambitions, focus now turns to implementation. So this means creating a solid decarbonization plan and carrying it through. So to implement the targets, pension funds must look to reduce their own operational emissions. So scope one emissions, scope two emissions from the energy or electricity they purchase. Um, but very importantly, they also need to invest in climate resilient areas. So this means reducing their emissions across their portfolios. 
So this doesn't mean that all um, assets need to be sort of clean and green straight away. Um, you know, there's a question on whether or not to take on any new assets that could potentially be risky. Um, but it does mean that all assets, assets should be defendable in terms of their environmental performance, um, including in a transitioning world. So credible decarbonization plans from portfolio assets are really key here. And if all assets are trending towards zero emissions over the longer term, then the pension funds themselves will be able to reach their net zero targets. Um, so these plans, so these net zero plans could be a requ requirement for any new uh, lending and equity positions uh, and or pension funds uh, can work with their existing assets to help them develop these uh, pathways to climate resilience. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so net zero credibility. Okay, so net zero commitments are currently voluntary and that means that there is a risk of greenwashing. Um, and frankly, even with good intentions, climate promises uh, can ring hollow if the implementation plan is not robust. So if we think about all the commitments that have been made um, over the last couple of decades from governments as well as private actors, um, we are still seeing global emissions rising. So this is really um, uh, this really means that there's been more and more attention paid to uh, greenwashing. So that means pension funds really need to ensure the cre credibility of their own climate plans, but they also need to look at the credibility of the plans committed by their portfolio assets. So at the moment, there is a lot of international initiatives that are looking at the issue of credibility. The United Nations and the UK government for example, championed this issue um, going into last year's uh, COP26 climate talks in Glasgow. And there's a lot of um, progress under, under those types of initiatives, such as the Global Financial Alliance for Net Zero, the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, and the Paris Aligned, uh, sorry, Paris Aligned Investment Initiative. Um, it also includes the, the work um, being championed by ex-Environment Minister Catherine McKenna, who is chairing the United Nations high-level expert group on the net zero emissions commitments of non-state actors. Um, and so that group is really looking to address the deficit of credibility. Um, they're developing a roadmap to, and their one sort of important point on that group is they're looking to translate that roadmap into standards and criteria um, that could inform regulation. Another great initiative uh, here is the Science-Based Target Initiative. So that's a collaboration between the CDP, the United Nations Global Compact, the World Resource Institute, and the WWF. Um, and on top of all of these sort of international initiatives, there's also an increasing number of service providers that are offering assurance on cl climate metrics. So in the same way uh, that these firms offer assurance on financial metrics. So pension fund managers can really lean into these processes, both in terms of vetting their own targets and metrics, um, but also for vetting um, uh, the metrics and uh, targets of their assets. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the last block that I'm gonna talk about is the net zero disclosure. So building trust around uh, the commitments um, requires regular reporting on key metrics. So it really makes sense that if you make a climate commitment, you need to disclose the relevant metrics that are needed to track progress on that commitment. So um, that's exactly what's happening at the moment in the United States. So the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, um, released a 534 page uh, draft rule uh, in March uh, and it included mandatory scope one to three emissions reporting and other metrics needed to track progress on voluntary targets whenever these targets have been made. Beyond the scope one to three uh, GHGs, public listed companies and some, some financial institutions such as banks as well 
will also need to uh, identify climate risks on their strategy, business model, and financial outlook, as well as their government frameworks and processes for managing those risks. So um, uh, there's a lot of international frameworks um, uh, that can offer clear guidance here. So the ones that uh, people sort of turn to the most uh, frequently are the TCFD and the Sustainable Accounting Standard Board, so SASB. Uh, and there's other initiatives as well, such as those under the International Sustainable uh, Standard Stance. Sorry, International Sustainability Standard Board. There's also mandatory climate disclosure um, already emerging or already mandated in countries such as New Zealand, uh, the UK, uh, the EU, and Canada has sort of signaled a very strong, a strong uh, commitment in this space, including um, last year under the G7 finance minister's communication. So a lot happening on the climate related disclosure, um, but Regardless of all the attention here over the last few years, uh, researchers such as ourselves, um, beneficiaries such as ourselves, um, and stakeholders in the financial community continue to face persistent challenges around information integrity, accessibility, completeness, and comparability, making it currently impossible to track progress on most pension funds' overall climate resilience. So pension funds themselves also face this transparency gap because in order to report on prog progress for their own net zero commitments, they need robust reporting from their portfolio of assets. So two years ago in 2020, the CEOs of Canada's eight largest pension funds, funds called for increased transparency from portfolio companies. And in the absence of having all the required data, some pension funds are sort of taking on these um, different, different approaches to trying to estimate their uh, portfolio emissions. So for example, they can use third-party data to help fill the gaps, um, although this is clearly not a perfect substitute for di direct disclosure. Um, they can start by disclosing their most material um, sources of emiss emissions first. So, start, so for example, some have started with the oil and gas sector um, there's also um, a, a recommendation under the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, so the PCAF, uh, which says to identify the sectoral distribution in the portfolio and then associate that sector with different emission intensities. So that these are all very good ways to begin. So the point is, is that there um, needs to be continuous improvement of the data that's made available using the current best practices um, and this is going to be important while we go through this transition period of having assets with robust reporting. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the main takeaways from our research, um, well, first of all, is that Canadians are increasingly interested in understanding how their retirement savings are being managed responsibly in relation to climate change. So, so we had a lot of interest uh, in this report. So from the media, um, for example, Toronto Star, National Observer, um, and people just sort of coming up to ask us a lot of questions about how they can tell if there's savings or contributing to any negative environmental impacts. Global governments are also increasingly aligning their policies with climate science, science pointing to accelerating transition risks and they're also moving towards other interventions, such as mandatory disclosure. So, all of the, the, uh, the, so putting this all together, it means that now is really the time to build climate resilience by setting and implementing credible climate targets. And as we discussed, reaching those targets will require assets to be climate aligned, including by having credible net zero plans of their own. And we highly recommend mandatory or third party vetting a relevant metrics to build trust. So um, I think uh, actually a slide, please. That brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, so I'll hand it back over to Alexandria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alexandria, we can't hear you. 
Am I back now? Yes. Here we go. Okay, yes. Fanta fantastic. So I appreciate that was a fantastic presentation. We're going to now turn to the Q and A. And a reminder is, if you have a question, I invite you to type it into the chat box at the bottom right of the screen and direct it to all participants. I will integrate as many questions as I can into our discussion. So first off, I'm going to be asking Anik, what are the main climate related opportunities for Canadian pensions? Um, thank you for that question. So uh, the main climate related opportunities for Canadian pension funds are in um, physical assets. So as we know, Canadian pension funds, the larger ones at least, have the technical knowledge, the team, the expertise to invest in physical assets such as infrastructure, uh, real estate, um, natural resources. Um, so uh, in terms of sectoral opportunities, uh, we highlighted this in another report that was done by SPI and our partner, the Transition Accelerator, where we uh, looked for uh, opportunity, uh, 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 transition related opportunities for Canada. And so we identified sectors like uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles, um, hydrogen, green aluminum, sustainable agriculture, um, and on top of that, these uh, opportunities need to be underpinned by uh, other sectors. For example, the main one would be net zero electricity. So uh, Canadian pension funds are investors in these areas. They already have investments in, the, in grids, uh, in say carbon capture and storage right here in Canada. That is another opportunity I missed out on. Um, so, Canadian pension funds can uh, continue to invest in these areas, but I, as I pointed out earlier, in order to invest in these areas, pension funds and the uh, other stakeholders, in particular the government, through their mechanisms, like for example, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank or the recently announced Canada Growth Fund, need to work together to make these uh, infrastructure opportunities uh, bankable or attractive for these pension funds. As they are global investors, we see that they have investments in other countries like the UK or Chile or India, um, in areas like airports or toll bridges. But uh, there is a need to bring that uh, investment right back into Canada. And this is where it needs to be a Team Canada effort with uh, all the stakeholders aligned together to make this. Uh, uh, investment opportunities for net zero are bankable and attractive for all, all the stakeholders combined. No, enlightening. Thank you so much. I looks like I have a two part question here for Catherine. It's mentioned in the paper. It's mentioned in the paper that many of the Canada's pension funds have adopted approach that does not rely on a Canadian taxonomy. How effective do you think approaches are regarding the labeling of green or transition investments? Um, okay, so yeah, there, as I as I sort of mentioned, there's a lot going on with taxonomies um, at the moment. So uh, in Canada, for example, um, there's work on this under the Sustainable Finance Action Council, so SPAC. Um, and these, you know, these discussions have been pretty challenging. Um, Classification is hard, right? Like not everybody is going to agree what fits where, um, and it's not the first and only place that we've had to have these types of conversations. So, sort of um, looking at policy in this space over the last uh, several years, we've seen, for example, um, discussions, similar discussions around clean tech, right? So, uh, for tax incentives or um, other government support for clean tech, like what, what counts, what counts as clean tech, right? Uh, we even saw it as well for um, emissions at the national level. Um, so, for an example, on farm fuel use, does that belong in the energy sector or does that belong in the agriculture sector? Right. So, a lot of a lot of discussions, um, but it's really important to try as uh, try as hard as possible to get onto the same page. Um, you know, build trust and allow for comparable data. Um, so we do have some examples um, uh, of approaches and challenges here. 
Um, so, for example, CPP um, investment. So they committed to reaching 130 billion in green and transition linked assets by um, 2030. So nearly kind of doubling uh, their current level of investment in these areas. Um, and so we were able to sort of see the aggregate uh, figure, um, look into some of the, the investment types such as renewable energy. So those are sort of like, you know, clearly defined as green. Um, but when you look at the two um, buckets together, together, so the green and the transition linked, um, uh, it, it's, it's less clear sort of what belongs where, right? So it's, you know, it's, these, are, these are challenges for sort of observers and researchers like ourselves, but also for sort of stakeholders and beneficiaries. And in terms of um, what pension funds can actually do, how can pension funds work collaboratively or even by themselves? to harmonize approaches in the absence of a Canadian taxonomy or transition taxonomy? Yeah, so, I mean, we've seen um, various approaches taken. So for green assets, as I said, it's you know usually sort of a little bit easier to define. So um, there's sort of these pure, pure play activities like a renewable energy. Um, and so pension funds can point to sort of existing taxonomies that are out there, such as the Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, or the EU's green taxonomy, although um, we've seen some challenges with that lately as well. Um, for the transition taxonomy, um, uh, we've seen, seen sort of varying approaches being taken. Uh, so the CPP investment, for example, say that transition aligned investments are any asset that has announced its commitment to net zero with a credible target and plan and is making meaningful contributions to global emission reductions, um, whereas SP investments says that transition assets are investments that have committed to make a substantial contribution to the low carbon transition through uh, targets and disclosure. Um, so, you know, similar, but not exactly the same. So again, like a little bit difficult in terms of the comparability. Um, and so the, the really the important sort of enabler to this approach um, is making sure that those underlying um, commitments and the transition plans are credible, which is going back to some of those uh, those two key pillars that we already talked about uh, in terms of sort of um, reporting and uh, vetting metrics. Um, maybe just quickly as a reminder as well, the the um, sort of this upside investment, so the investing in climate solutions is not one of our key recommendations in terms of building uh, resilience. So. Those types of um, you know, targets and commitments are are very welcome and very important in their their own right, uh, but we do see them as as slightly separate from the fundamental um, need to build resilience through committing to net zero across uh, the portfolio. Right, so they they sort of saying that you're invest ones investing in a climate solution can't really comp compensate for areas that might be climate risky. Um, and that sort of actually is is um, something that we've seen sort of coming out um, in some of these mandatory uh, regulations or what might end up being uh, mandatory regulations with the SEC. So they do say um, that uh, if you make a commitment in this area, that you should be reporting the metrics. So any sort of upside investments should be re reported, um, but only if you're making sort of these these commitments in that area. Um, okay, so sorry, sorry yeah. to get you off. Okay. The no, question just yeah, starting yeah, to get yeah, fast and furious right now, and I wanted to get through as many as possible. Um, yeah, there's been a couple of questions coming in around fiduciary duty. So this is now that I've asked you both one, I'll let you decide amongst yourselves who can who's mm -hmm. going to feel this one. What role do you see for pension regulators in Canada? which need to supervise how pension plans are fulfilling their fiduciary duty in providing retirement incomes to beneficiaries. Uh, so, yeah, I can take that one. So, um, I think two years ago or last year, in fact, there was a legal opinion from the Canada Climate Law Initiative, which stated that uh, climate related risks and opportunities are a part of fidu fiduciary responsibility. And it is well within the pension beneficiaries' rights to ask for, like, to account for these changes. We have seen um, the case in Australia against REST, where, where you know, if you don't take account of these fiduciary responsibilities seriously, pension, uh, the trustees can, uh, you know, go to court with uh, with the pension plans themselves. So it is well within their right. Uh, and in terms of regulators, um, 
there are a couple of things that the CAPSA or the Canadian uh, Pension Supervisory Authorities are doing in terms of mandating in their ESG guidelines, but there needs to be a bit more in, the, in this area. Uh, part of the reason that it is difficult in Canada, I would say, is that uh, the regulatory structure for the largest Canadian pension funds are balkanized across like provincial lines. So uh, we did a report previously on Canadian uh, pension staff code for responsible investment, where together with our partners, the Natural Stuff Canada and Corporate Knights with support from the Trotier Family Foundation. And there we found that uh, the 12 largest Canadian pension plans have eight different uh, supervisory or regulatory uh, bodies uh, managing them. So it is difficult to so, uh, some extent like managing them. And so the role of CAPSA here would be critical in like aligning these uh, regulatory supervision and like, taking care of fiduciary responsibilities. And so building on those, those are all like crucial things to have to be able to do. But what do you see challenges or pathways for pension plans that are smaller in size? A lot of the discussion so far is focused on the larger, uh, the larger eight. And so those pension plans that are more the small to mid size, um, how do you recommend them proceeding if they don't have the same amount of resources to identify, model, and manage climate risk? Uh, so I can take that one as well. Um, so um, in terms of managing uh, for the smaller pension plans, I think there should be um, two things. One, there should be guidelines as to how uh, it should be uh, like uh, what climate risks and modeling scenarios look like for the smaller pension plans. We know uh, for a fact that the smaller pension pl plans rely on external uh, managers. And so it should be uh, clear what, you know, what are the expectations from these external managers in terms of scenario analysis and investment guidelines uh, in climate related uh, opportunities. And also um, there should be um, combined effort where the larger pension plans work with the smaller ones um, to provide guidelines as to what can be done uh, in terms of, uh, say, scenario analysis or scope three emissions, et cetera, um, where, uh, so that um, you know, the smaller pension plans have an opportunity to learn from the, you know, the larger ones in, in these areas. Yeah, and maybe just to add to that as well, um, we've also seen sort of a staggered approach taken in other jurisdictions. So. For example, the UK, when it became uh, the first uh, jurisdiction to mandate um, climate related disclosure for pension funds uh, last year, um, they sort of said, OK, you know, the, the bigger schemes with five billion pounds plus um, would have to start with their mandatory disclosure in 2021, whereas the smaller schemes um, would stagger in as of 2022. Um, and we've seen that sort of as well with some of the um, uh, the data that might be required under the SEC um, draft regulation, that it would be sort of, there would be a staggered approach to how this data um, would be sort of audited in the same way as financial uh, data uh, with um, smaller pension plans given sort of more leeway and more time here. Um, so it really does provide us, and he said, a chance for those larger pension funds to act kind of as the, the models here. No, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, this might be a little bit of a con more controversial one. Um, and so we got a question to, to add on the fiduciary duty conversation from earlier that says, there's a vocal minority that's concerned about the appropriate of pension plans making impact investments. Would you consider investments in climate solutions impact investments and how that relates to fiduciary duty? Could you, could you repeat that one more time? Oh, that? absolutely. Um, a vocal minority is concerned about the appropriateness of pension funds making impact investments. Would you consider investments in climate solutions impact investments and how that relates to fiduciary duty? Um, I mean, yeah, so again, like again, the, the investments in climate solutions are slightly separate than the key recommendations in our in our report that is lo really looking at avoiding climate risks through um, you know slowly moving away from these climate risky assets over the longer uh, term. Um, investing in climate solutions is is sort of in some ways a separate um, issue. 
Um, and what we what we're really interested in this space is okay if these you know if Canada needs these climate solutions to hit their uh, targets, then how can we make the investment landscape more attractive, right? Um, so we're not necessarily if we're for that type of research, we wouldn't necessarily be thinking of it as impact investing. We would be more thinking of it as how can we make those uh, investments smart, right? So what type of enabling environment would pension funds need to see? Um, you know, for example, again, another UK example, but uh, there's carbon contracts for different schemes used by the government there to um, promote investment in offshore wind, right? So those, those types of policy tools can be used uh, rather than sort of, um, you know, expecting that, that capital to flow to those areas without uh, without the right enabling environment in place. So. Uh, sorry, just, just to add to that conversation there. Um, so, in terms of uh, investments, uh, the pension plans work hand in hand with their portfolio companies, and so the real contribution would be to reduce emissions in the real economy. Um, so, pension plans can work together with these uh, large uh, carbon emitters to reduce, help them reduce their emissions. So that would be like the angle that should be taken, contributing to the real economy in terms of uh, uh, emissions reductions. And pension plans with their technical abilities and know-how can uh, can help with that. Absolutely, no, I totally on board with that. We're down to the last couple of questions. So, what account? Ability should be in place for pensions that set targets not aligned with 1.5 degrees Celsius or for pensions that are investing in pro projects that don't align with their targets. I know we've discussed that many of the major pension funds are setting targets, but not all. So how would we advance ones that are not aligned? Yeah, I mean, uh... A lot of it is transparency, right? So this, I mean, yeah, this is this is in some ways it's sort of a new area for some of us in the climate space, um, and we have, as we said, seen sort of increasing attention on this issue, right? So as um, uh, this int intention, sorry, this intensifies, then we expect to see sort of the beneficiaries, so those those uh, people saving for their retirement and wondering what's happening. With their savings uh, begin to sort of question um, uh, the climate resilience, right? So, so I don't think it's something that um, uh, that you know policy can necessarily um, impact. It's more something that I think like beneficiaries and um, you know pension funds themselves as sort of responsible stewards of long-term capital uh, need to really look at and. Uh, you know, you know, there's also like a lot of global momentum um, around these types of um, net zero targets. Uh, net zero was not a thing only a few years ago, right? People were taking targets that were sort of getting minus 20%, minus 17% from a base year. Um, and we've really seen this explosion of net zero targets. Um, and, you know, this it's not going anywhere. Things are just going to sort of build up from here. And oh, I just have one final question. Um, I think it sums up the webinar nicely. And so we're it's very encouraging that our major pension funds are setting these net zero by 2050 commitments. But obviously there's some differences between them. Can you elaborate on the net zero plans across these pension funds or speak a little bit to the differences in the commitments across the funds? Um, sure. So could we uh, turn back to the slides? I think slide 17 it was. Is that possible, or like I, I can speak to it um, by myself? But uh, it might be easier just to speak by yourself because we have. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 No problem. No problem. So as I mentioned before, the plans vary across the funds, and it really highlights their mandates, their existing portfolios, and the information that they have available on hand. And so if we look across the four dimensions that we talked about in terms of boundaries of targets, so we would see that. Um, so, yeah, the slides are coming up. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, yes. this is the one. So, yeah, so here we have the 8 pension plans and. Uh, there are 2 slides. This is the 1st 1 is the emission reductions plan and the 2nd 1 we have after that is the green and investment targets. So, coming back to the, um, uh, 4 dimensions that we talked about. In terms of the boundaries of the net zero uh, emissions reductions target, 
So we see that uh, the pension plans are trying to include the full scope of emissions, which is re really important because this inclusion underscores like the effectiveness of climate targets. And in terms of time frames, if you can go back to the other other one, so you can see here like some of the pension plans have set uh, interim targets in terms of carbon intensity, and most of them follow the PCAP, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financial Standards, and so uh, and and the others are working towards them. And it's so critically important for pension plans to have these interim targets. Uh, we know like these global initiatives like the Net Zero Asset Owners or the GFANS that is led by Mark Carney. Uh, if you want to be a signatory there, uh, you must have emission, uh, like uh, interim targets. And so these targets provide guardrails for future emissions reductions. And uh, so there, there is a bit of variation across the funds in, in this aspect. In terms of uh, mitigation strategies, we see that, uh, could you go to the next slide? Uh, so, in terms of mitigation strategies, we see uh, on the on the left that CDPQ has a plan to exit from oil production by 2022, and this was what I was talking about previously in terms of divestment. But most of the funds on the right, you would see like they have active engagement strategies where they would want to talk to the high carbon emitters uh, with their management or through shareholder proxy voting um on like how to reduce emissions, and this is what would contribute to like real emissions reductions in the real economy and there uh, and the other aspect where there is a bit of a difference is the green and transition investment targets so the pension plans such as cpp and uh, ontario teachers have aggregated green and uh, transition investment targets others such as the healthcare ontario and psp have staggered or different uh, targets so they have a green target and a transition investment target and while the others are working towards their own targets, the UPP, for example. So there, there are some subtle variations across the funds. But as I mentioned before, that, uh, you know, I, uh, as these global initiatives like GFANS or Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance develop, and there are, uh, and, you know, the pension plans hopefully join them, um, uh, these uh, differences should fade out and there should be one standard as to how like these net zero plans will evolve uh, in, in the future. No, fantastic. And it, just to plug, if you haven't read the original report, I highly recommend checking it out. There is a wealth of knowledge um, as well as original research that is very pragmatic and provides great direction. And so to wrap up, I just want to thank everyone, um, panelists, for the robust discussion. And once again, Catherine and Anik for joining us today.